Hello, this is Hakurabin, and today we are going to r slash D&D Horror Stories. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. <sighs> am I oversensitive, or am I supposed to feel this way? Hello, sorry for my English, I'm not a native speaker of it. A little drama manifested recently in my life, and I don't know how if I should feel hurt by it or I am sensitive, so I will ask you. Maybe you will help me eat to the side. My friend K has another friend M. You have a lot of friends with letters, that's pretty interesting. That she plays with d and I, I met at M briefly, and K a few days later said that M was calling me names. Really bad names. We talked only a few minutes with them, and it was pretty basic. Nothing controversial, nothing unusual, just small talk, so I didn't take this as something important. Of course, Kay said that. She didn't, doesn't think like him. And she said bad things about him to me. The part that hurts me. After a few days, she said that her character and his has a romance. After she told me that, and I felt betrayed. Kate tells me that's only characters, and she has the right. And for someone that I was considering my friend, I felt hurt. For my friends, I'm ready to stand up and said what I think and defend them, so I don't know if I should feel betrayed by, by her actions. And that she tells... He thinks because we always tell her the truth. I know this is not... I think, but I need someone objective. <sighs> wow, for some that someone who said that they might be a little bit bad in English and they're actually a little bit oh, they're still better than a lot of people. Anyway. Yeah. It makes sense to be feeling a little bit upset about that because they did kind of uh, betray you. They might have the right, but that doesn't make it the right thing to do, you know? Well, let's get into the next story. <sighs> we have a lot today. I expect that a lot of them to be short like that. Player tries DMing for the first time. Other players actively ruin his game so he wouldn't do it again. So for context, I wasn't around for this. I am our group's permanent DM. But at this point, end of time couldn't attend weekly so every other week my players would play board games. One of these weeks our newest player, let's call him Barry, decides he wants to try DMing. Now, Barry isn't very ingrained in nerd culture, but he loves seeing d and loves Warcraft. World of Warcraft. You like World of Warcraft, and you still don't think that he's in nerd culture? Okay. So he decided he'd literally run World of Warcraft and D&D. Not inspired by just D&D and the World of Warcraft world, he asked me if this was okay, and of course I said yes. I was more disappointed I wouldn't be able to play. Now, Game Night rolls around and Barry and the other three players set up. Barry introduces the world and says players have all been summoned by the king. Problem player, let's call him Joe, decides he's not in using a game for D&D. And is going to be a dick about this. He made the games hard, apparently given he's played Warcraft and knows the plot. I don't, so I don't know how bad he was. For the first three hours, Joe wanders off to random map points to witness events he shouldn't. He insults high-level characters openly and lures innocents into deadly traps. By hour four, they are summoned by the king again. Joe then tells the king he's going to try to do not safe work stuff without his consent to the king. Barry kind of laughs it off and carries on, but Joe keeps saying these things and then says he pulls down his pants. At that point, Barry's staring old character has the king teleport Joe outside, so he's banished, and he's lucky his team have saved the war realm. Joe attacks the guards, saying he can't and 
at a castle. After four rounds of combat go by and Joe isn't trying to fight, just trying to go inside, he does and gets to the king, who after or all this uses power word kill and kills Joe's character outright. Joe says that's a bad DM move. Barry and the other two players agree that he was warned. Barry says he should write up a character who is more heroic, so he does. He writes an oath of vengeance paladin who is a who is the child of his last character's son and sworn to kill the king. That's not very heroic, that's just fuck you, I'm gonna do my own thing. It's supposed to be a collaborative story writing thing. Very unsuccessful made combat with this random out and attacking guards. He didn't quit to be a DM to be a quit to be in the text next the next day and says to be frankly, he'll never DM again. It was heartbreaking because he put a lot of work in that. The only upside is that I removed Joe from our long term D D game and replaced him with a few other players who were interested. It was about eight months ago, and Barry still refuses to DM again. <sighs> Screw you, Joe. Screw you. I later learned from Joe he didn't want two campaigns running at the same time, so that's why he destroyed the other campaign. When I was and asked why he even agreed to play, he said it's because that's what he we did on the, on a Wednesday. Screw you, Joe. <sighs> now another story. What happened here? I've been watching a lot of videos on this subreddit, so I decided to trust my own little horror story here in the form of an Am I the Asshole? Be warned, my memories of this are very foggy. Two or so years ago, I decided to DM for the first time at my first ever group that I played in. We did session one and it was very fun. I can't quite I remember why, but I was looking for another player to play in my campaign. So with the help of my at the time DM, I posted a looking for player post on a on a D and D beyond the Discord. One person messaged me about it and we were talking back and forth. Because I thought he was a chill guy and didn't mind being a new DM, I let him join in. He played an old Toro guy who had been who has been traveling for a very long time, and his most prized possession was a golden pennant and necklace. He was looking for something he had, and he had a reason why he joined the party. My DM was the only one who could make it, it for this session, so I decided to have a, a small introduction one. DM's character meets his player's character in a shop. He was looking around to buy some things for his travels, because the yeah, you know, um, his character was a row of loving shiny things. He decided to steal that pendant. And after asking the player if he was okay with it and agreeing to it, I let him do that. I thought it would be an interesting introduction, but that's unfortunately what happened. The player's character caught the M's rogue stealing his most prized possession, and he wanted back, of course. The two had a brief, had a brief back and forth of give it back. No, I need it. It's very important to me. Come and get it then. With DM, of course, just joking around, teasing him before player f or slammed his desk and said, Man, fuck this. This is bullshit. And just left the call on server, leaving the both of us stunned and me hurt. I managed to message the guy about this a bit later, and I then explained to him that my plan was to have the group come in and make real give the fans and back. As an apology, he would help out a player's character and let him travel with them. But he was the one who was okay with this in the first place. The campaign felt slowly faded away, and I stopped playing until recently. Now I got the courage back to DM again, and I've run in my own little story on occasion. I have a truly awesome and support group that I love of a lot with an epic DM, and I'm beyond thankful for that. Am I the asshole? I think that, um, you let the player know that they were, you asked and uh, got permission beforehand. You let them know that this, this was going to happen, 
and you had, had a pretty fair plan. I don't think you're the asshole in the least bit at here. The player just overreacted and should have had a little bit of patience. Alright, let's go to the next story if your eyes can handle it. Problem player almost kills our entire party. Oh gosh, this is a long one. I was not expecting this. Let's go. <sighs> this is the first game of D&D I've been a part of, and 21 sessions later, I'm in love with my character and team members, minus one. My first tabletop game was actually pretty bad. <sighs> we have a party of seven. Jeez. Combat has to be torture. I can't imagine. Large size of our DM does a fantastic job of giving people the spotlight and moving scenes around equally. Consisting of three rogues, one bard slash paladin slash warlock, one ranger slash street rude, one mark slash barbarian, and the problem player. Why do you have so many edgelords? <sighs> the pro player was originally a blood hunter fairy, but I couldn't tell anything was different from wizard because I didn't use any blood hunter abilities until 12 sessions in. Okay, that's fine. Everyone role plays differently. I guess, but you should be able to tell. We had just arrived at a magical little beanstalk, and some of us wanted to ride the top as it was growing. The DM straight up told us, if you want to ride this is up at the speed of speed that it's going, it will be over 10 and X rolls until it reaches its peak. If you fall, it will be instant death. Okay, fair enough, we don't get on ex except for the fairy. During his ascent, we are attacked, but the fairy is 1500 feet in the air and is enjoying the fight. While we are, are fighting, he is continuously asking when his turn is, but even if he flew down, it would take too long to get to the fight. As each, each round, he ascends higher. We finish the fight, and the fairy reaches the top, where there are three orbs that look like doors to another plane. He says he would like to cast, cast Reduce on the orb and place it in the bag of holding. After multiple warnings that this would kill him, playing in the inside of a plain nuke, he still goes ahead and does it. Cue the chaos in the orbs disappearing due to the explosion. Nice. Future plot point completely gone. While it was annoying to watch, his character was the only one who died, so we just moved on. It takes him three sessions before coming up with a new character. And I feel like I can ask about those were the most story progressing and fun sessions I've been a part of. He finally comes back to the next session with a four forged artificer, and surprisingly, his personality has changed. I let him know after the first session. Esh and I really enjoy how he's playing his character and can tell he really puts some effort into the background. Later that night, the other players told me this happens often, but if his character is die, he comes back with a more sober slash char serious character, but devolves into the being of mischief. A couple of sessions later, of sessions later, he gets a pair of dice from the god of chaos. Roll 2d6 as long as they are not double ones, what he asks for happens. I worry at this point, but can't forcibly take the dice from this character. We find a general we need to kill from the opening faction and load him into a trap against some um, stone giants. While waiting for the giants to whittle down the general's numbers, he starts rolling the bone dice saying, I want to kill one of the giants. It's basically instant death for the stone giant. 
I'll get to ask why he did that, because that's the exact opposite of his plan, he says, uh, 40 XP. We've had multiple talks with this character about player knowledge and character knowledge, and push him asking how his character would know what XP is. He eventually relents and says, well, my character wants you guys to think he's cool. Again, we ask, by doing the opposite of what we, of the plan we agreed on? The character just laughs and says, yes. At this point, everyone at the table is tired of this and joins the fight. During the fight, the war, the war forge rolls the bone dice and says, I want this fight to be over. The god of chaos asks, what would you consider to be over? He answers, everyone dead except my friends. His turret grows inside at Isaac after the death roll, and our DM states, Name ally combatants as the turret, it's AI. He just says at the DM, he doesn't know any of our characters' names. He calls a couple of, char of our characters our actual names, forgets all, all eight of the small army of NPCs we have with us, and calls the last person something not even close to their characters' names, like Amber instead of Anastasia. At this point, I'm actually upset because uh, something out of my control is going to get my character killed, along with all my friends' PC. He's killed. One of the other player sites went whispering the names until all enemies are dead along with all of the NVC allies. Immediately after the fight is over, the fire slash monk attacks him with him three times and knocks him down to 8 HP while the others surround him. He rolls the bell dice and asks for us to be his friends. Some godlike power saves our hand from killing him. It left a pretty sour taste for all of us. Two problems here. One, the DM uh, let him have those eyes in the first place. What the hell? And two, you you can't be letting someone use a magical item to remove player agency like like the DM did just then. Next, he tells us it's getting late. He needs to go home an hour early. And this wasn't oh I fucked up. I need to leave. He was sick for drove girl and laughing while leaving. I don't know if I grant it was war is warranted or we are all assholes, but I feel like I need it to vent into the ether because it's killing me having to wait until next session to talk to about this with the other players. This DM is uh, horrible. Giving someone a magical item that is uh, almost guaranteed to give you uh, anything you ask for. Like these uh, bone god, like these bone dice, was actually a bad idea. I think that the dice should have worked the opposite way, where you only get the magical wish if you roll a double sixes, if they're like, I'm guessing 2d6. At any other case, you don't get anything. 91% chance of success is just boring. It's almost as bad as um, this one time when I was playing D&D with someone and uh, this other player on the team that I was on kept on rewinding time to give me another chance to roll. Because them doing that made it so I couldn't fail. Oh, here we go. I'm definitely a problem, but I don't know how much of a problem. Forgive me, English is my first language, but I have a nasty headache right now, so the story may seem a little disjointed. 
I tried to keep it concise, but let me know if you're having trouble following. I'm very anxious to, to, po to post this because I'm 80% and sure it'll, I'll get torn apart in the comments. But I'm probably just overthinking it. I'm 23 female. Hey, I'm 23 and a girl too. I live with my boyfriend, 31 male. And we play D&D with our friends, neighbors, roommate, and my boyfriend's co-workers. It's a party of five total. So I'm guessing you have like one friend, one neighbor, your roommate, your boyfriend, and one of his co-workers. Wait. But then how are you in there? The math ain't mathin' for me. Our roommate, two of the other players, and our boyfriend are co-workers. Okay, so... One of those other two players is our... Neighbor alongside his girlfriend. The last player aside from myself... Oh, we play in person. I've run the PC mini. He's as well as the paint all minis we get. We have a lot of minis. Cast list goes as follow. Us. Roommate slash coworker slash friend will be known as Farmer Ninja. He was a caster flavored as a ninja at the time. He sends character swap out. No, his exact class. I I know is he had fog cloud and it was said that double sight didn't work through fog as that was his whole plan. So he swapped literally the session after. Elodrin. Elodrin is a far easier thing to say. Male neighbor slash coworker slash friend will be necromancer. So for cleric bard multi class with a focus on necromancy, half elf. I'm gonna call him Tom. Female neighbor will be not rogue. So for who behaves like rogue stereotype as a klepto and murderous wood elf. I'm gonna call her. Sam. Samantha. There we go. Just coworker will be Barbarian. Black Dragonborn. I'm gonna call this one Bob. And I'm a Blood Hunter. Blood Hunt Shifter. Just OP. Boyfriend is a DM. I'll just call it the DM to DM. <sighs> so, for some quick disclaimers, I'm in a state of high emotions right now. My emotional regulation has been fucked recently by everything. Not just this, but everything going on in my life. So I have no, I, no clue if I'm being unreasonable. In hindsight, I can and usually tell when I'm, I, I'm the issue, and I fully recognize I was an issue in this situation. I just don't know how much in comparison to the others. I only really have my boyfriend's opinion and I don't know how impartial he is or if he, it's just because he didn't like seeing me upset. We're in for a doozy. Not going to go through the entirety of the campaign up to that point, all you need to know is that non-humans are oppressed, often slaves, the previous session to garrison ran out a small encampment of Simic hybrids along with the party because the previous guy in charge let them stay. But nothing happened to him so now the new guy didn't want on them there. The city we're in is known for being progressively progressive secretly. Like wearing fake slave collars around and stuff like that. <sighs> you know, that never made any sense to me. How in almost every D and D or fantasy setting, or just a lot of settings in general, humans tend to get either overpowered or just take control of a lot up more than they really should. 
when you consider all the D D species that are sentient, humans are quite literally the weakest of them all because they are just the default that we fall back on because they are familiar to us in real life. But when you consider our elves with their high agility and uh, and then dwarves with their sturdiness and their strength. And even orcs and half orcs are way a, a more powerful than and humans. While yes, humans can and obviously do a lot of things, it just doesn't make a, all that much sense for me for them to have supreme power over a high fantasy setting of any sort. Not unless they're in, um, not unless they like know a lot of magic or something like that. I think that maybe it's just my opinion, but I think that in a lot of magical settings, I could see humans as more likely to be depressed ones than anyone else because they are not likely to have any power. Oh, I'm getting off track. Anyway, so right now, we come back and there are some guys ransacking the camp since no one is there anymore. We need to get past them. Needless to say, fight breaks out. There's five of them. But Raiden cares, kills one. Not Rogue kills one. The rest of us spare ours. Small, very relevant, and aside, my character is a pacifist. She's not a pacifist in the, in the sense that she won't kill or commit violence. I think pacifism in D&D would be you just don't kill. Committing violence and self-defense is different. But she does have very specific criteria for not killing someone. She doesn't like to kill a parent or anyone under the age of 20. She herself is a parent and, and doesn't want to be the reason a kid's missing their mom or dad. The under the age of 20 thing is because she doesn't want to kill someone who's got a lot ahead of them. She may also release someone if she respects them enough, aka accepting that to protect something they care about. Uh, that at one's very rare. The idea is that she asks them their age and if they're a parent, and depending on the answer, they live or die. I was not expecting this to be an every single time thing, just to relegate to rules, really. She's not the type to get mad at people killing here in battle because she understands that you can't always control if you kill someone in life. Or that situation. So I tried to make her the easiest kind of pat as fist to deal with. So no shame if you kill in a fight. Just rolls. Not a role played out scene every time. Not opposed to killing her and maiming. I always say that I explained this alongside her response to someone basically she really doesn't like multiple times. Say you saw her mid interrogation to kill the NPC she's talking to. Yes, she will strike and will deal damage. It's unarmed damage using claw. Also without her blood right. So 1d4 plus 5 of damage, no elemental damage, if she misses, she doesn't try again. If you swing back, she won't attack and let's go into it. You need to taunt her, her to get her, her to actually fight. Part of it is that she wants to show she's unhappy with your actions, not to bring into full on PvP. I've tripped people in previous games and it was all good and fun. <sighs> Makes sense. Sorry if I'm over explaining things, but I want to make it very clear. You'll see why in a second. I also don't want to make it clear up to this point. Neither of these things happened. Finally, I get to do the very first interrogation thing with her. This has never gone to happen before because this is Eshin 4, I think. So I was excited, especially with terrible rules leading up to this. So I was in, in, in the best mood. She gets her questions off and bam, since both were no, Barbarian and not a uh, rogue killed the guy. I tried to communicate, I didn't like that though. Oh, I didn't do the link damage thing. I used my words, explained what I was doing in character. Here is where it takes a, a good turn. They go up to guy number two. I'm not using the names I made up for them, am I? I kind of forgot. And ask him um, the questions. And the moment he confused, he's waking up for days, says, No. Bam. Both at once, kill him. They were made a bad headspace. To me, they were mocking my character and basically. A piece of from the in the most shallow way possible, even though they thought it was stupid.
Third and final dude. I have my character moved, so she's between what I saw, what I in the moment now uh, am now considering murder, murder hobos. I asked Kevin the parent question, and I got a yes. I was so excited. I mean, this was my first proper win of the night. And with this, I was going to prove that my character's morals are worth something. Well, turns out, he's an absentee father to a small child he's ever met, and doesn't send any to. I was crushed. And I just let them kill him. I just needed one win, and that was just not my night. Loss after loss after loss after loss. Things got implicitly hostile after that from my end. And my character even said to the characters that she hated them. And apparently I had enough venom in my voice to the point where my boyfriend thought I was going to cause some proper PvP, even though I told her multiple times that Blood Hunter's course of action would what my blood or, or his blood hunter's course of action would be. And I would not initiate PvP in any other fashion since and because Golden Hurts hit them again tells me they want a proper a fight. She still, to this day, has not done even done the taking a swipe at something, by the way. There was no yelling, but you could cut the tension with the knife because unfortunately, I use Vibe Arsenic when I'm upset. I wonder what that means, but I feel like I understand. By the end of every session at that point, I've given everyone how my character rates their characters so far, and I would have liked for them to do the same thing with mine just because I like knowing where my characters stand in game relationships and friendship. With the hostility that was apparently misinterpreted at this time, as the not rogue thought that I was raising her as a person, the wide variant was 0 and the not rogue was a 3 on a scale of 10. I, as a person, would have rated both as 0 as I don't like either character, but my character. I had a positive interaction with Dot Rogue earlier. And she had, had already gone off on a, a, off to a rough side with Barbarian. He tried to smash in the mat of someone my character was talking to who was on the ground probably bleeding out. Well, I'd slide because the guy was a part of a mage tower that had kept his Barbarian captive and removed scales and essence it from him. So his was already low. And Not Rogue started out of 5 because she was his only introduced last session. Our disclaimer is that I would never rate our act people on a scale of 1 to 10. That's stupid and rude. I find fun for characters, but it's not a standard I'd apply to real people. My real scale of rating people is, do I love them? Do I like them? Am I apathetic to their existence? Do I dislike them, and do I, I di do I hate them? I like not Ro Oak out of character, and I'm apathetic, leaning slightly towards, slightly dislike towards Barbarian, mostly because of a bad first impression. But every out of character interaction has been neutral. It was like for Session Zero, which we treat as, on as a character related thing, but a, a how did you get to the starting location without a complete character sheet after having been told he needed to have it done. Then assumed after a few hours of character building that he'd still be getting the introduction that day. And then he was like to session 0 0.5, which basically turns to session 1 because 90% of the party was there. The sessions ended soon after this. I was on the verge of tears and was trying not to lose my composure until everyone left. I had a bit of a meltdown and my boyfriend tried to calm me down. They were just fodder to them. Not rogue is overly sensitive and thought that when your blood and hunter said I hate you, it was you talking to her. That was their idea of fun. You just say none of that was helping me and I did realize I was a major part of the problem. They sent me into even more of a frenzy because I was trying to grapple with the idea that I was in the wrong. Was I solely in the wrong? Am I overreacting? Is it my all my fault? It's a problem. I'm a problem. I'm the problem. The primary problem, though, was that and it was clear I, I was already a little upset and they had late and they had a blatant and regard disregard for how I was feeling. Then the whole deadbeat dad thing happened, and that was a real tipping point because it felt like I'd been thrown a bone after bad rolls all night. Only for it to have been yanked away with a fishing line. <laughs> what happened here is that the characters and the DM are actual douchebags to you and your character.
I have no problems with someone playing a pacifist character as long as they don't get it, 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 into someone else's business about it. That's probably the only thing that people don't like about uh, passive characters or a lot of uh, vegan and, and folk. Like, you do your thing, I don't mind. But as soon as you try to make me do your thing, it's not real, it, it, it cool anymore. It's not nice to try and force other people to go down the same path of life as you. Obviously. So you want a pacifist character that doesn't kill when the certain conditions are met. I don't know why you had to meet those specific conditions, but it's fine. What is not fine is a is a seeing someone who clearly had a thing that they were going for with their character, and then deciding to completely disrespect and just be a, a complete jerk about every part of it. That is not okay. What these other players did to you was not okay. And while I think that the whole entire rating pe rating in people's character is at the end of sessions sounds like a fun idea, it can't come off as condescending. <sighs> but there's more here. Once I convinced myself I was overreacting, I sent the I sent both of them apologies. And as an apology for the whole group, I made everyone unfortunately slow of journals based on their characters. Though I know for a fact I was the only one in extreme emotional distress that night. I nobody else went home crying and Rebief had gone over and to talk to not Rogue briefly, never said anything about crying, and I don't think she's able to keep it together for half an hour. I still couldn't get over the lack of care and disregard for my feelings. That is what I'm seeing in this game as well. I'm sorry, I'm commenting a lot when I shouldn't be. I never got an apology from either of them. There were times I considered telling them I wasn't going to play until I got an apology. But I never or did actually make that a threat. That threat would have been an ultimatum and a bit of a power play. If it's truly how you feel or oh, oh, things, things have to go forward, I could get it, but at a certain point, feels a little bit controlling or manipulative. <sighs> Let's see. I said this was gonna be a long one, but I didn't think it would be this long. We still have three more after this. It's four months later at the time of making this post. I'm in a bit of a mental health crisis, but because of many factors, both in and out of game, including this incident, incident, I'm not having fun with this character anymore. I love her, but there are so many compounding little issues with this interaction i been the catalyst for the beginning of my losing fun with the character. I'm wondering if she's worth it anymore, and today, all those issues came flooding up to my boyfriend. All the misinterpretations of things everyone has said, including him, and how while I am able to rashly tell that those interpretations are dead wrong, that doesn't stop the other half of my mind from making it affect me great me greatly. It's a wound that's festering and nobody helped me. Necromancer and Ninja stood off to the side at once Barbarian and Not Rogue began arguing over with me over the first guy. Ninja had to see uh, OCA from the game because the double sight and fog cloud out didn't work together. And Necromancer didn't do anything except after before the first who died, he tried to make a voice of reason but quieted up at, because things got tense. My boyfriend making the guy I had deadbeat just made the situation even worse despite having admitted to seeing me struggling and getting upset. <sighs> Hmm. 
First of all, there are so many things that I do not like going on in this game. Ninja is searching for the game because of the Devil Side and Fog Cloud not working together. Why didn't they... The DM can make an exception for it or any rule. That's part of D&D. You make up of stuff as you go. Like... I think that Ninja should have been able to do Devil Side and Fog Cloud with some uh, men, men addling of the, some mangling of the rules because uh, it's cool that way, you know? The rule of cool kind of trumps over the role of the books, in my opinion, especially in games like D&D or other TTRPGs. I didn't do the best job of describing the, in the interaction. It was four months ago. I can only remember half my half of, of specifics. My boyfriend thinks they were part of the problem. That was convinced the biggest issue was the way he handled the situation. You were not stopping them. Yes, that is the biggest issue. I'm still not sure if I was the biggest problem or not. But I know I blew things out of proportion, but I still want an apology for the disregard for anyone but themselves towards me specifically. Should their fun and killing and neutralized threats come at the expense of another or player's fun? No, not at all. It's weird and uh, and disturbing to me. You shouldn't and be finding enjoyment out of killing in a bit, in, in games like this. I mean, there's enjoyment to be had in uh, finding creative ways to defeat enemies and probably e e in a way kill them, but. There is a, 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 a limit. It should never. Your fun should not uh, 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 inhibit someone else's fun. So when a one one player spares their their opponent, you don't come up and kill that opponent instead. That's not how you play a a, a games with other people. I think even my mom has actually said this before, and I'm not sure if this is like an original quote from her or just a quote out in general, but the rights end where another person begins. And uh, your fun killing can be limited to characters that you already e fought. A neutralized threat that someone else has already spared is not something that you really should be e killing in, in a D&D game. It's not only e cruel, but also unnecessary, and a waste of uh, of time and actions. All of this claim flooding out, out because I'm contemplating and abandoning this character, as she's been ruined for me. And I try to explain all the issues I've had with this one character. Not all of it has to do with the game, but a lot of them do, and a decent amount of them are the um, choices and comments. But this is a festering root of my thoughts. I want an apology. I want a big one. Just a sincere little, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't want a big one. Oops. Do I deserve that much? Do I deserve an apology at all? After you left for work and shot a message explaining everything about my blood, I wonder if that had something to do with the problems I'm having. I was just back telling him about 60% of the issue because there are some things I can't put into words. But I realized I saw how important it getting an apology was to me. And finally, after I mentioned I want an apology several times in the two weeks after the incident, stopping for a while and finally bringing it up, up again today, he offers to ask them. But now it's way too late, I think. Any apology will be insincere because it was an event that happened in a game four months ago. Why am I holding a grudge for this long over a stupid game? They'll probably feel this came out of nowhere, whereas for me, it's been a problem since it happened, and they'll just do it to keep the peace. Because from what I can tell, both out of character or non confrontational for the most part, I don't think I'll ever get a real, real apology from um, them. Should I ask for one? Is it too late? Or do I not deserve one? 
Every time I think about this situation, I'm wrestling with myself of or if I deserve or what it or not. And my current issues are not helping. Ever since then, there have been no humanoid aid enemies, so my sparing people or things still hasn't happened. And my, you have lately said it was because of this situation. He's so, he got the amount of humanoid enemies, so I probably won't get my chance ever. I still have not yet initiated PvP or even hit anyone in the game yet. I've only explained the course of action, and now I feel like a, I need to explain it a million times more so that people understand I don't want to initiate PvP. I actually hate PvP. Sorry if this entire story is hard to follow. I have a headache, and I've been very upset recently. Even the smallest stressor makes it worse. But, I, but what I want to know is, am I the biggest slash only issue? Do I deserve an apology, or am I, I actually delusional? So long didn't read. Probably fights a bunch of dudes. Two die, three live. They're neutralized as threats. But nobody try as to defuse the situation as I feel disrespected, humiliated, humiliated and uses by their actions and killing them while I tracked actively trying to do something with them at the ensuing reveal. <sighs> so, to answer your questions, no, OP, you are not the biggest issues. The two murder hobos are, are, are probably the biggest issues here. Not only did they disregard your feelings, do something that clearly bugged you, but they, they, they seem to uh, uh, be making fun of you while doing it. Do you deserve an apology? You deserve an apology. It's not going to help because it's never going to be sincere or act actually from a place of regret. And no, you're not being a delusional. And I don't think you're really that much of a problem player at all in this case. They uh, went out of their way to murder already in non-threat enemies that were basically not enemies at that point, but were NPCs. <sighs> and basically mocked you while doing so. Anyway, let's go to the next story. And let's hope it's a lot shorter because I can already tell now this video is not going to get any views. Oh no, another long one. Okay, it's not that long. The worst DM I've, I've had. Sorry if the title seems a little pretentious for uh, this particular person. Really worse as uh, the worst DM I've had so far. We'll call this person Mask. Because that was his screen name and the three other players Blue, Tech, and H. Hey, actual names instead of classes. Let's go. Even though I guess it doesn't really matter as long as they aren't like letters or numbers in my experience. Or the word subject over and over. And I guess sometimes in my case, SCP whatever. I like names. Now Mask and I had actually been in a campaign together already. He's been a player in one and a half of mine. And one day he messaged me and said he needed a fourth, and I agreed. Now the campaign was mostly fine enough until I swapped out my Dragonborn Warlock for my monk slash cleric, slash cleric Asimar. And Tech swapped his human monk for a cup old artificer. Now at some point Tech ad adopts this meteor alien thing that has a long and short sword that can both cast fireball. Oh. There's also a secret organization in town that uses their special currency and Tech and Blue are the ones that would normally find the most 
disposals of this special currency. Lou would normally give us his special currency because we often found equipment that was conveniently best suited for a rogue. So he never dared to buy anything. Also because they only sold special items, Mask would understandably roll for them which would be fine it was for the fact that Tech was always able to get things he wanted and H and I never found anything we wanted. Now my character's whole reason for being in there was that he was sent to investigate these magic towers. This is an important fact that I waited until now to bring up because as uh, one, the tower or is where the whole point of the campaign, and two, Mask told me an organization like mine doesn't exist in D&D, and I need a new reason to be there. I based the organization off of the dress so, so, from Mass Effect. Later on, thanks to the meteor alien, we have a demon samurai chasing us. My character tries to reach out to his family for help, but all he gets is a bloody note that says no cheating, and Mask says the demon wiped out our entire home city. He then shortly after says uh, the real reason he did so was my character who has a reason and to be NH and I are the only ones who see who see a problem with that. Yeah, that is a major problem. This DM is uh, playing completely is absolutely playing favorites here. That's not your, what you're supposed to do as a DM. I should also mention that H had given up on trying to do anything meaningful or side plot wise. He had his giant ant weasel that he brought from the pet shop, and he was just trying to find a girlfriend. I mean, I personally didn't notice this until he pointed it out, but he only ever rolled high enough to find a woman in that town twice. Once it was a hobgoblin disguised as a woman to rob people, and the second time it was once again a dude in disguise, but this time it was buff, basically so typical gay guy who straight up kidnaps H's character. Sounds like a transphobic stereotype to me. And takes him to a private room and forces him to eat cake, essentially, so he could draw. I know what some of you might be thinking. I promise you, well, someone who's DM for him twice and been in campaigns, he has no problems with those kinds of interactions. And if he did this time, I mean, he should have said something not uh, to do that. No, this sounds weird. The DM seems to be a bit more problematic than I thought. Later on, he then has the audacity, the audacity, the audacity, freaking hell, to ask me and H why we don't seem interested in doing anything other than fighting when the plot tells us to. We, of course, bring up, up all this and more. He tries to convince us that it's not as bad as we're making it out to be. This rather book that comes back was us finding out that. A tech was a sub DM and working with a, a big bad evil guy. Hey, I left and reformed my old team, the my old group without those three. I saw over half mask ad, ad as a friend on Steam and Discord because while he is a, a crap DM, he's still a good guy and a great player, which might seem impossible to some people. Great. God damn it. This is a long one. And this one is... Uh, with like no actual format. I should have checked before I actually started the video. <sighs> Pay to die and hunting the child. Greetings Adler. Let me weave you a tale of woe and unbelievable greed and bullshit. Actually, you know what? No. Our video is too long already. I'm not reading all that. Not to mention, no formatting means that it's going to be basically impossible to read. Final one. The formatting is far better, but the story length is going to make this video over an hour long. Let's go! I didn't need views.
fixed. I have experience with the leeching. You got to go. Oh, spotlight sealer. Oh, this we're we're ending on a bang. I really use credit. Sorry about the name issue last time. You don't have to be rude though. Oh yeah, by the way, um, outside of actually making videos, I don't really use Red that much. All right, so a few months ago, mid to late 2023, hey, that was just last year. My older brother, who is our DM, sorry, campaign, the session and and because this is of me, 19 and female, Ron, 32 male. Adam, 30 email, and the DM, 23 email. Adam is the prom player in question, and has been kicked out as of February 11th. That's not too long ago. That's like 10 days ago. And this was posted 8 days ago. So this, is, this was like 2 days before this was posted. We play D&D Weekly, and at first, Adam was a useful and flavorful addition to the party, as his character was a chaotic, neutral, wood elf, bard, slash rogue, with a noble black, with a noble background. Wow. Who was very interested in business and negotiations, with the only setback being, he must talk in third person. Sounds like an, like an interesting uh, curse or habit. Adam comes up with very interesting, unique characters and gets into character very easily. Which is why at first, he was cool and fun to be around. We eventually gained two new players, Carl, 29 male, and Amy, 28 female. So we had a part, a five player party plus a DM. I had faith that my brother could handle five players, and he did. It's not the worst ever, I once seemed seven people. Five is a bit pushing it, though. I think four players is uh, more in my speed. But also, it feels like with four players, you kind of um, can cover the basic RPG -y stuff. You have your tank, your healer, your DPS, and your AoE damage. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Over time, however, Adam's bard character became more and more of a drag on the rest of the party. Adam constantly talked over others, split from the party often, but would always go, my character follows him when someone else tried to split and do their own thing. Oh dear. I've seen this. I've seen this, I've been this, he's new. That is what's going on. Basically, a lot of new ooh -ooh players get really excited about everything in the world of D&D. So they want to be involved in everything. And they don't quite get that, no, you're not a part of the situation. We'll take as much of the DM's time as possible and always found a way to make a roleplay scenario about him or get the NPCs to talk to him, etc, etc. He essentially made roleplay for everyone else at the table feel like a chore because we all had to wait for him to finish or talk over him, in which case he would pretend like he can't hear us and keep going. Yeah, this happened a lot. I did this. I remember my younger brother did this. It was uh, not easy. Pretty much in D and D, a lot of newer players have a bit of a hard time understanding that D and D has turns a little bit like Monopoly or other board games, or like when someone else is talking, you don't talk over them because the entire game is a role playing game, so it's all all basically in your head. And to talk over them when it's not your turn is uh, in, in, impeding in the fun of everyone else. 
So far, I have nothing against this. This is just a learning moment. This can be easily remedied by the DM by explaining what's going on. Or when they interrupt, just make them roll all of the 20. And when they roll, you punish them uh, um, um, in game and for or talking over them. Maybe my first DM was not a good DM. I mean, obviously they weren't, but still. Adam, as the title states, is also a leech. Adam lives in his car. He's homeless, essentially. He has a job currently, but he lied about one of his jobs a while back. He had a job at a gas station and crashed at Ron's place for a while. When he knew he could stay there for a while, he quit his job and didn't tell Ron about it for about three to four months. Then Ron met the boss guy. About the gas station manager and told him that Adam quit and also Adam appeared to pay a this woman, his previous boss, for nudes. Ron was extremely pissed and stopped letting him crash there overnight. We are all sonars except the DM. Me, Ron, and Carl will occasionally bring our own THC cards or flower to the table to share. Ron, Adam, Carl, and the DM Vates Ape Slash Smoke Nick team except me. They also bring those to the table to share and buy them with their own money. Whenever I put forth my own THC pen that I spend money on, he sucks that shit down like it's nothing. He will also hold on to my pen for as long as possible and sometimes hide in his hand or pocket when he takes hits. He does this more or with his own vapes and and pens, so no one will see it. I once had a brand new, completely full cartridge, spent the last my cash on, on it, and by the end of the session, a quarter of it was gone on from him. When he s shares, he is extremely stingy. <sighs> I mean, uh, this is great for building up how annoying of a person he is, but like, I have no strong uh, opinions towards drug use at all. You know, like if it's a, is if it's legal in your area, go for it. If it's not, probably don't. Is the only thing I can really say. Anyway, I, I have also told him my battery does not have a blinker. It will continue to burn for as long as you hold the button. Adam takes the longest, most ridiculous hits ever. I've timed it before. He first takes a 10 second inhale, which usually would activate the blinker. Then while still inhaling, he presses the button again and keeps going for another 10 seconds. When or if I get my pen back from him, it's hot and burns my hands. I would just to ask him for my pen back, unlike Carl, who will take a hit or two and hand back like a normal person would. He also never puts forth any shared snacks or buys food only for himself. Oh, that's a sin. You can't go to the in the game and not share snacks. That's literally against the law. Don't you know D&D &D law? You can be late to a game, but you have to bring a snack if you're late. It's kind of like if you're late to work, just bring some donuts and everyone will be fine with it, except for your boss, who, who will be just kind of under hard ass anyway. But everyone else will go down in your boss's case for being such a jerk and being mean to you when you brought the fucking donuts. I don't know, I've never been to work. I've only been to like one job, <laughs> and I never or, or had money to buy donuts. Adam constantly asks to burn smokes off of my brother and Ron. He also constantly asks to hit Carl and Ron's vapes. Adam has money and a job and is fully capable of buying these things himself, but chooses to be a total fiend. He spends all his money paying off the debt of some woman with two kids who has zero romantic interest in him. She's essentially cucking this guy for his money and she neglects her kids in Adam's care to go out and get some. He has a brought these children over two or three times and they stay up until 2am and don't listen to a single thing they're told because they're neglected. 
and also talk over us the entire time. Yeah, younger folk do have a hard time with with D&D games. I have noticed that at, at in my experience. Me and my younger brother were pretty young in our first D&D games, and I remember that later on when my nephew was playing with us, as he was a little bit off topic or didn't quite know what was going on. That thing the game kind of wasn't too good either. We've actually made a house rule of no kids unless they're blood related. What's funny is, Adam literally has two blood related kids of his own, but he doesn't see or talk, talk about them. Ever. Ron has two kids and his daughter was occasionally join our game as a fairy dragon. Oh, how nice. Adam's bard character eventually died to power or word kill, and my character died in the crossfire of to power word kill 2 I'd rather kill him on purpose. He was planning to do this for quite some time in hopes Adam would create a less egotistical character. That would allow other players to play their own character. This, however, did not turn out to be the case. <sighs> of course not. Adam's new character was an heir to Nazi warlock with a fancy English accent who is obsessed with bones and ne necromancy and, also ask, and often asks, Say, when you die, may I have your bones? Again, another awesome, unique character. Aside from the leeching without paying people back and the talking over other people, I was actually hoping Adam would be a little better to sound around with this new character. Boy, was I wrong! We usually are when we hope for our good things. We usually are. The new character, according to Adam, is lawful evil and much more is, and much more mischievous than the bard ever was. The DM wanted Adam to play uh, neutral or lawful neutral, etc. But Adam kept referring to himself as lawful evil. For those who are not uh, unaware, lawful evil are people who, who use the law to do not so good things. This is usually reserved for our people like the BBG. I should probably explain alignments in general. When you want a character that you can pretty much just say, that's what my character would do, you can pretty much make them a chaotic neutral character. Chaotic neutral means that they do not care for the law uh, as of society, and uh, and will do what uh, they think serves them best, regardless of their moral, uh, of any moral or values. Someone who is lawful good, uh, tries to uphold the law and cares a lot for, or the a, a, a benefit of others around them. Think your favorite at Paladin. Lawful neutral is someone who follows the law, but in a way that they see fit. They follow the law, but they are but they don't really have any strong morality. It, it towards good or, or evil, I guess that you could say. There's nine, nine of them. I think that I, I have some, some of my own opinions. Because let's be real, d, &D alignment is really based on how of you or opinion is, not really by how it actually works. His actions were not lawful evil at all. Lawful evil is someone who is bad but still abides by some morals or law. Obviously, like the BVG. Our next session with both me and Adam's new character is we heard a, a screech of a recurring monster called an Obsidian Wraith that is much higher level than us. So it was our cue to GTFO, especially considering we had King Quintess so with us, who is really beloved of NPC Eric, named the Greek adjacent to Golem, and turned into his human form to become King.
What did, what did Adam do? He had up Genasi to play a prank on some men moving wood to fix something, thus crushing them and killing them slowly and slowing us down. Very chaotic uh, evil behavior if you ask me. A chaotic uh, evil character is something like most monsters that you will fight in a D&D game, or in any RPG that is. Think your goblins, your, your monsters in general. They don't follow any laws, they are just bad. They are, are just evil and they don't follow any laws at all. The DM played it easy on us and we still got away from the obsidian raids. We exchanged some glances. Next session, February 10th, Ron skipped out on us, because he was fed up with Adam. I also DM'd a one-shot for a bit, and Ron skipped every session because of Adam. I now plan to retcon everything since they haven't gotten to the reveal, and hopefully Ron can come along this time. This session, my new character was, re was revealed to actually be a mind flayer, not a drow. Early into the session, and Adam was on his phone for the first 30 minutes of the game. I had run my character spent a good chunk of time drawing it. I for him to take a glance up from his phone and go, uh-huh. Wow. Just no interest, huh? He was playing a mobile game and only put his phone down when it was his turn to talk and roleplay. Oh. I know I played some mobile games. I used to play when they were good, okay? There was Jetpack, Joyride, you had Fruit Ninja without all the ads. You had some good uh, mobile games in, in, back in the day. I mean, now I play some good mobile games that don't have as many ads. They still have a pretty weird gotcha system, though. That's just it. His turn! We had to implement a system that we don't need now that he's gone, where everyone rolls fly initiative at the beginning, and that's the order for roleplay. Five minutes max for everyone's turn. We literally had to restrict ourselves just so this guy would shut up and let us roleplay. Adam would also try his absolute best to use up all of his five minutes. Well, that's annoying. If you're done, be done. We were in a city being controlled by mind flayers, and we found an underground cave of refugees who were free of the these psionic effects and plan to overtake the city once again. A fairy who was once king of them showed us a ladder up into the tower. The ladder is 200 feet tall, so it took quite some time to climb up there. Out freaking horse, Adam had to have of his character be first. When we all reached the top, we were in a prison portion, and a small one foot tall and massive goblin child came to free us and wanted us free other goblin children who were also enslaved to the leader of this hive. I believe a mind flayer or er, er, scion. There was an elder brain, but we may know more next session. What did Adam do this time? Well, we had the Genasi, who was invisible, pick up the golden child, walk over to the 200 feet ladder, and drop him down it. The golden child had the keys and also knows the layout of this place. My character was standing by the ladder entrance, hidden in the darkness, so I saw this happen. Forgive me for this next part, but I did cheat. I don't know, it seems a little bit justified. And I was 100% transparent about it, and with every other player except Adam, after the session ended. Including my brother, the DM, who excused it. I don't have Feather Fall in my spell list at the time. We leveled up at the end of the session, and I added it after. And so I just googled, hold it, and Medica as a Feather Fall on the Goblin Child. Thus, saving the Goblin Child last second. I literally had to metagame just so this asshole couldn't continue playing a chaotic evil dipshit under the, uh, under the guise of Uwu Level Evil. 
I felt horrible that I had to do this, so I guess it's an NMID asshole post us now. Then after I met a game slash cheat to save the only NPC that could get us out of life, I climbed down the 200 foot ladder to retrieve this child while the rest of the party were doing whatever else, and I talked him safely into my satchel and put my cloak over it. Me, Carl, Amy, and the DM all gave each other the, the stare of what the fuck is he doing? Which reminds me, Adam has bad games, timeless. It, I didn't give you this wrong word there. Multiple times before. Anytime something in common happens or something in role play happens and he wants to interview or change something, he just starts rolling without being told to by the DM. He also did the same type of thing in my brief one shot where he would just cause more problems because, oh, I hear them doing ABC, so I'm going to go and XYZ. Even if he's out of ear eavesdropping range and starts rolling for intimidation without asking to. <sighs> After Adam left, which by the way, he took a sweet time packing up and leaving, me, Carl, and the DM discussed his behavior and we updated Ron on everything that had happened. The next day, we, we went over writing a paragraph text for Adam to tell him what he did wrong and why he's out. Adam didn't even try to argue his case or say he would fix some things. Then he replied with a thumbs up emoji and then later was passive aggressive and said, Feel free to rip my character sheet. He didn't text Ed Carl. He then texted Carl, I may not come over for a while. Which, in Carl's book, is a good thing. Because a while ago, Carl was ordering food for him and Adam, and he said to go easy. But Adam spent $47 of Carl's money on himself. Wow, Adam kind of sucks. Like, at first, I was like, okay, this guy is probably new, so he's he's a little bit excited. I've I've done some... I, I've been a little bit excited at, at my first time playing D&D 2. But now, this is just awful. Adam is out lo no longer in our D&D group, and hopefully we'll, we'll leave Ron and Carl alone and continue using them and leeching off their items. We no longer need a security system to enforce or is no cross talking. We no longer have to deal with our tank skipping sessions because of one asshole. We no longer have to shy away from role playing because some guy won't stop talking. <sighs> Jeez, that was a long one. TLDR, 30 year old homeless man child, steals the spot I like from others, has character, here with a massive ego, old leech hour, or weed, smoke, oaks, food, and housing, has a new character that's lawful evil but acts chaotic evil, murdered two innocent workers as a prank, attempted to murder and enslave goblin child while the party was in danger. Forced me to cheat to and save the goblin child who was our only way out of a 200 foot tall elephant tower. Absolutely awful. That was long. Lucky, luckily, I don't have to worry about making the end end. The parts where this background is up, up long, long enough for them to become thumbnails because I already have a thumbnail for this video. That was r slash D&D Horror Stories. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!